Welcome. Merry Christmas. Isn't that great? We can say that out loud. I say it to everybody. <laughs> and I want to say thank you for being here today. I want to uh, invite you to be a part of our Christmas brunch today. It's going to be a lot of fun because we didn't have to cook it. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I want to thank you for being here. I know that there's a, a, a fair number of you here that are here for the first time and uh, want to introduce myself to you. My name is Pat. I'm the senior pastor here. And I would, uh, I would ask you to fill out the bottom portion of your uh, uh, program because that's our connect slip. And there's a picture of it right there. And if you just fill that out, see, it's not hard. It says name. That's you. Date, it's already filled in for you, took care of that for you. Easy. You know, check the little box. Why? Because if you are new today, we should have given you a book, a free book, a gift when you came in the door. Uh, if you did not receive that, you need to make sure you get that on your way out because there is a gift for you. But I'd also like to send you something uh, from myself personally, so I need your address in order to do that. So if you wouldn't mind filling that out, um, I would appreciate it. Also, um, you're probably wondering what to do with the Connect slip uh, and may have noticed that we did not pass a basket for tithes and offerings and financial gifts. It's not because we're so independently wealthy we don't need the financial gifts. How many of you know we still need them? Do you know that part? No, everybody's hand needs to be up on this one. Do you know we still need them? Thank you. Okay, you'll notice over here there's some black boxes right next to the door. It says give right on them. That's where you can drop uh, a gift, financial gift, or your connect slip. There's also a gray box out in the front right next to a kiosk that says give on it. So if you would like to give financially or if you have a connect slip to fill out and you want to drop it in there, we would appreciate that very much. Okay, what I think we'll do is start our study of the Bible with a little story. Yeah, you guys are catching on. All right, I want you to imagine a highway like this one. We're familiar with highways like this one. This is our neighborhood. And uh, I want you to, to, to imagine you're going down this highway and you realize you have not seen a police officer in 100 miles. And you're looking down that road and you're going... Just like that. You're, yeah, I, I see you. You understand, you know. You know you're, you're going down there. You don't see any police officers. You know the speed limit says 65, and you're doing 105. No problem, because there's no, no cop, no stop. We're on our way. We're having a good time. And, you know, you, you're driving along, and you kind of slow down to about 80 because you're feeling it a little bit. But you're still... You know, you know, everybody's passing you like you're standing still. So, you know, you're, you're having a good time. And, and um, you know, you kind of think that maybe, maybe the police have just kind of forgotten to patrol this particular part of the freeway. So you think that your little 15 miles per hour over the limit that's really no big deal. I mean, after all, everybody else is going faster than you. But what happens when you see this? Okay, when you see this in your rearview mirror, all of a sudden your 15 miles an hour seems like a rather large transgression. I and mean, it didn't seem so bad when you didn't see the cop, but it surely seems pretty bad. You, your heart misses a beat. <laughs> And you are no longer secure in the fact that other drivers are also going fast because suddenly it doesn't matter because the cop is behind you and not them. You see, you realize in that moment that you are personally every bit as guilty as the next guy that was speeding but you're the one that the law is pulling over. And so the fact that other people are doing it is irrelevant. And how many of you have ever tried that when the police officer comes up and taps on your window? Well, everybody else is going this fast. Do you think he cares? You know, he does not care. Well, people were going faster than me. It does not matter in that moment 
what other people are doing. In fact, in this moment, your transgression suddenly seems to abound, doesn't it? And how many of you have ever felt that adrenaline rush? Because I have. You know, I haven't had a ticket in a long time, but I still remember. You see, when the law shows up, it changes everything about your attitude, about what was going on. And honestly, this is why Jesus was born. Jesus is the cop in your rearview mirror. And that's what we need to talk about this morning. It's the kind of subject that a lot of people don't want to talk about and don't want to think about it. None of us like to have this in our rearview mirror. Nobody does. Nobody goes, oh, yay, I get to talk to a police officer today. <laughs> That's not what we're thinking. That's not how it goes. But so many people miss the fact that this is why Jesus was actually born. He's actually the police officer in your rearview mirror. But so many of us have tried to pretend that he's something other than what he said he was. Now, normally in this church, we go through the Bible chapter by chapter and verse by verse. That is our normal thing. And next Sunday, we're going to jump right back into the book of Romans where we left off. But for the last few weeks, we've been doing an Advent tradition. And we don't do this tradition because it's magic. We're not doing this because... We're so committed to traditions that we've lost sight of things. We're doing this because the whole concept of Advent, Advent means the coming of. The idea is to go, what is the real reason for the season? Because too many people have lost sight of it. I mean, even when they tell the Christmas story, it has been so twisted in our culture now that the idea of, of, of the birth of the Christ child is now all about love. And sure, it is about love. All about family. Well, sure, it, it's about family. All, all, all about poverty because they were poor. Sure, we need to remember the poor. We need to give gifts. All of those things are true, but that's not the reason that Jesus was born. And when we talk about Advent, the coming of, we're going through piece by piece. What are, we're aiming for this one thing. What is the real reason that Jesus was born? What's the purpose? And that's what I, I want to talk about this morning. Now, obviously, Christmas is about the birth of Jesus. But what does it really mean? Because you see, more than 85% of Americans, more than 85% self-identify as Christians, but that same 85% when they are polled really haven't got a clue what being a Christian is. They don't even know. The same poll that was taken to find out how many people identify as Christians also asked specific questions about Christian doctrine. And everybody fails except for about 8%. Roughly. So of the 85 to 90% of Americans who call themselves Christians, only about eight can actually answer, what is a Christian? So what does that tell you? That there's 85% of people that are not really Christians? That's what it means. They just don't understand the difference. See, the majority of people, they have sort of a vague idea of what being a Christian is. Some people will tell you, and, I, and I've, I've, I've gone and polled. I ran around and asked. I thought, well, why not, why not ask? Why not go find out for myself rather than read a poll? Go just ask random people over at Starbucks, which is an interesting question, what is a Christian? And, you know, and since I know all the girls over at the, uh, uh, you know, they all know my drink when I walk in, you know what I mean? Because they've all gotten to know me over time. I can ask them a question like that. And since none of them are believers... I got some interesting responses. See, the idea of being a Christian is being good people. That, that's, that's what being a Christian is. Being a Christian is people who go to church, like you, pastor. Yeah, yeah like me. It got me, caught me there. I'm, I go to church, <laughs> and I am a Christian. And, you know, but it was interesting listening to these responses. 
The idea of being a Christian is just, it's all about loving others. Well, yeah, that's true. And Christians do go to church and, and Christians do believe in Jesus. Now, I had one person that had a vague idea of the idea that, well, Jesus, um, you know, I, you know I, he was born and he, and he lived and he died on, for our sins or something. Uh, yeah, or something. They're, they're, that's true. And I'm not trying to mock my friends. I'm trying to point something out. That there's a lot of people that have an identity problem. They call themselves Christians, and they haven't got a clue what it really means. Now, I've been a pastor for a while, and I'm also here to tell you that there are people, plenty of them, who self-identify as Christians and can give you the doctrine behind it, the teaching behind it. They can tell you the, the, the basic concept of the atonement. They can, they can tell you about uh, the incarnation. They can give you some, some basic details. They, they, they have some understanding, and yet at the same time, when you examine their lives, something is missing. They know what, what Jesus did on the cross. They understand the resurrection. They know what it means to believe but they're still missing something. And then there's a third group of people that I've worked with. And these are people that, you know, they, they prayed a prayer at some point in their life. They, they figured it out that, well, I, I'm afraid of going to hell and, and I've, I've committed some sins, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Jesus to come into my heart and forgive my sins and, and I'll be good to go. And they prayed a prayer of some kind when they were eight or 10 or 12 or 22. But the problem is, they're not growing. They're not changing. When you look at their lifestyle, it, it, it's still filled with things that don't look a whole lot like Jesus. And, and, they, and they, they, they compromise constantly and don't even realize it. I know one lady that was you know, f you know, talking, you know, asking for prayer at work and, and saying she was a Christian and all of these sorts of things. And then there was another lady in, in the office that, that was um, uh, saying that she was, uh, g uh, you know, going to get married and go on a honeymoon. And, and this person who had presented herself as a Christian and said, I'm, I'm a Christian and all this and, and, and asked for prayer in the rake room and everything looked right at her and in front of everybody said, well, why are you bothering to get married? We don't have to do that in today's world. And, I, and I, I'm, the juxtaposition between these two things is kind of jarring. So there's a group of people out there. They're nominal Christians. I'm not complaining about them. I'm not mocking them. And I'm not judging them either. What I'm saying is they're out there and if that's where you're at, where you've made some nominal profession of faith in Jesus at some point, but your life has not changed in any way, or you find yourself still missing something, then what I want to do today is I want to go a whole lot deeper into what it really means to be a Christian. I want to go down there deep. You see, because there's still a lot of people that become Christians primarily, in fact, this is the number one reason that a person will say, I'm going to become a Christian, or I'm going to pray, or I'm going to start going to church, or I'm going to start reading the Bible. Number one reason, I got problems, this can solve it. That, that's what they think. And I, I want to be clear about this. I believe that God is a great problem solver. How many of you know that? And I believe that if you follow God, many of your problems will find a solution. But that's not a reason to become a Christian. I mean, if, if your reason to start going to church, start reading the Bible, and you, you think that's what a Christian is, and there's a lot of people that do. Oh, I know what a Christian is. They go to church, and I'll start doing that, and therefore I'm a Christian. No, you're not. Or I'll start reading the Bible. How many of you know the devil knows the Bible inside and out? Okay, it doesn't do him a whole lot of good either. Okay, so just reading the Bible just... Going to church, that's, that's not it, kid. And if you're doing that because you've got a marriage problem, my question is, what's going to happen when your marriage problem gets solved? Let's say it does get solved. 
you're having a problem and you're, you're, you're having a marriage problem. You, you start going to church, you, start, you, you get into counseling, you meet with Pastor Doug or whatever, and things get better. And I've seen this, I've seen this so many times, I've lost count. People that started coming to this church because they had a major marriage problem and we counsel them, we work with them, we pray with them, we teach them. And then when things get better, they're gone. But they're not just gone from the church. That's not what annoys me. What annoys me is they walk away and they don't grow at all. They don't change. Or worse, you decide you want to become a Christian because you're having a marriage problem and then your marriage does not work out. And you wonder if you've been sold a bill of goods because somebody said, if you become a Christian, well, then this will solve your problem. And it didn't solve your problem. This has happened to me multiple times in this church where somebody, I, I remember one in particular where I, I, I baptized this guy and I baptized her and, and you know, we, we were really working with them and their marriage did not work out. And then all of a sudden, the man in that situation felt like he'd been sold a bill of goods and he quit. And he's fallen away and fallen back into drinking and all kinds of problems over here. Why? Because that's a shallow reason to become a Christian. Very shallow. It's a, it's a, it's an under, it's a lack of understanding of what it really means. You see, and if, if you're looking for a fulfilling of an emptiness in your soul, if you're looking for uh, help with an addiction, if you're looking for answers to life's deepest questions, I'm here to tell you that yes, following Jesus, it is likely you will find those things. But that's not the reason you should be a Christian. That's not the reason you should come to Christ and that leads to shallowness. Now what do I mean by shallowness? It's where you hear the message and it springs up in your life and you get excited about it and, and you flourish for a little bit, but there's no root. There's no depth. You haven't gone down deep. You don't understand the depth of this. And because of that, when hard times come and they will, and when, this, you know, when, it, when, when life beats down on you and it will, it, you know, the growth that was there, it withers up and it dies because it has no root. It hasn't gone deep. And that's what we need to talk about this morning. We need to understand the difference between, you know, coming to Jesus or thinking about the birth of Jesus uh, as a means of solving a problem. We got to understand the word believing a whole lot more. Now, when I talk about believing in Jesus, there's different ways I can use the word believe. I can say, I believe I'll have another Dr. Pepper. And that means a whole lot different than I believe in America, which means a whole lot less than I believe in my wife. When we talk about believe, believe in, those words, they've become so plastic over time that we have a difficulty understanding what Jesus meant. See, when Jesus explained himself, why was he born? Why was he here? Why was he doing these miracles? This is what he said. Take a look in John chapter three, verse five. This is what Jesus said. He said, the truth is no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. Now he's talking about when he says the kingdom of God, he's not talking about joining a club. He's not talking about joining a church. He's talking about the place where God is in command, where he rules, the, where his peace, his power, his plan is what rules the kingdom of God. If you want to be a part of that, this is what Jesus is saying. Now, this is John chapter three. See, he's answering a question. We've got to look at it in context. This guy named Nick shows up. And he's at night because he's afraid of everybody. He's a leader. And he shows up to Jesus. He says, Jesus, what are you all about? That's really what he's ask, asking. I mean, if you really read it and you get into the context and you get down underneath, what, what, what Nicodemus is saying is he's going, who are you? What are you all about? Why were you born? Why did you show up? Who are you? That's what Nicodemus is asking. And Jesus answers in a funny way. He just gets right to the heart of it. You can't enter into the kingdom of God unless you're born of water and the spirit. 
Verse six, humans can reproduce only human life. In other words, that's being born of the water. Water breaks, you are born. And that's the only thing that humans can do. They can only reproduce human life. But the Holy Spirit gives new life from heaven. So don't be surprised at my statement that you must be born again. Jump down to verse 17. He says this, God did not send his son. Now he's talking about himself because he identifies himself as the son of God. And he's saying, now he's speaking kind of in the third person about himself. And he's saying, look, God did not send me into the world to condemn it, but to save it. See, there is no judgment awaiting those who trust me. That's what Jesus is saying. But those who do not trust me have already been judged by not believing in. There's those words. Believing in the only Son of God. Their judgment is based on this fact that the light from heaven came into the world. That's Jesus. He's the light. He's the way that's going to show the way to God. And they loved the darkness more than the light. Why? Because their actions were evil. Now, evil, what is evil? Sometimes we look at that word evil and we go, well, my actions are not evil. I'm not an axe murderer. Well, we're about to discover what evil means. When you get down into it, and I'm not going to pull up the Greek this morning, but the word evil means anything that is contrary to the nature of God anything that is contrary to the nature of God. That's what evil is. You know, we, we, we identify evil as Charles Manson, and that is evil. That's just hyper evil. Okay, it's just a lot of evil. But evil is anything that is contrary to the nature of God. Now he says, look, what I'm telling you here is that I came into this world not to judge it, but to save it. Now, how do I save it? Well, by you trusting in me in some way. And that's what we're going to get into a little bit more in detail. What Jesus is saying, listen to me, in this passage and in several others, is that people, all people, all human beings, are condemned to hell. All human beings are condemned to hell if they do not put their trust in the Son of God to take away their sins. This is what he is doing. This is the center of the Christian faith, and it's why Jesus came. He is the police officer in your mirror. He is looking at you and all human beings and tapping on your little window and saying, you are speeding. You have broken the law. I am the police officer, and I am bringing one of two things to you. And he says it right there. He says, I'm bringing judgment to you, or I'm bringing salvation to you. The choice is yours. I can bring either one because I'm going to bring judgment because you've already been judged. You've already been judged. It says your actions are evil, plain and simple. And because of that, that means that you love darkness more than you love the light. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying you are already condemned. There is a place called hell. Hell is a place by the way, you know, people get all upset and worried and, and they get, you know, mad about that. Look, Jesus spoke a lot about hell. Hell is a real place and you do not want to go there. You don't want to go there. C.S. Lewis describes hell very well. He says, what hell is, is where we feast upon ourselves. There's nothing else. We have chosen ourself over God. And so God says, fine. Because in the end, God is either going to say, your will be done, or you are going to say to God, God, your will be done. There's only two choices. And if you choose self, that's what you're going to get. Hell is a place of darkness because God is light. Hell, hell is a place of loneliness because God is relationship. God is love. And if you reject those things to choose self, all you're going to have is to feast on your own soul forever. It is a place of of absolute despair because the more you feast on yourself, the more you swirl around the drain and the more you realize there's just, there's nothing here. There's nothing but emptiness. There's no fulfillment. There's no validation. Does that make sense? And that, that's what God is trying to save you and I from. That's why Jesus was born. He is the police officer in your rear view mirror. 
Now, the truth is, people don't like this kind of a message. This is not a growth message. This is not the one I'm supposed to preach on Christmas Eve. On Christmas Eve, we talk about babies, and we talk about gifts and frankincense and myrrh, and we talk about gifts tomorrow, and we don't talk about how we're all a bunch of sinners that are going to hell without Jesus. We don't do that part. Unless you come to this church. And the reason is, is because I'm going to tell you why Jesus was really born. See, people want to water it down, and they want to say that, that you know, that, that Christianity and being a Christian is all about love and about, about accepting others and, and doing good for others. And I'm here to tell you that being non-judgmental and loving others, that, that's all true. That's all good, but that's not it, kid. That's not where we're at. In fact, any good, listen to me, any good that you do, any good of any kind has nothing to do with you. It's just an echo of the good God who made you. Because within yourself, if you're honest, you're a rebel. You are constantly saying, me first. You've been saying that since birth. You came out of the womb screaming, me. Okay, and we've been screaming me ever since. It's all about me. It's all about what I want. And what Jesus is saying is he's saying, you've chosen the darkness, that's darkness, over the light. And the light is choosing God over yourself. Let me say it again. This whole life is just a stage. This whole life that you live is just a stage acting out one question. Will you choose self over God? That's the question. That's what it's all about. Will you choose self over God? Now, the first thing you have to recognize is that you really are choosing self over God. And I'm about to prove it. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says it this way. He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody say the word all. all. I checked it in Greek. It means all. And that's all that all means. <laughs> it covers all. Everybody. It covers all. And it means that all have fallen short of God's glory. What do we mean by falling short of God's glory? Well, he gave us a standard. Back in the Old Testament, he gave us a speed limit sign. He said, here's the speed limit sign. I'm going to give you actually 10 of them. All right? And these 10 are your speed limit sign. These are the things that are my standards. This is it. This says, you know, hey, th this is my list. Now, as soon as we go through the list, everybody says, well, that's not fair. Nobody's perfect. <laughs> oh, but you're wrong. There is someone who's perfect. The creator, God himself. And he says, here's my standard. It's who I am. This, this is it. These are my standards. And people say, well, I'm not that bad. All right, well, let's, let's, let's ask. How many of you have ever told a lie? Raise your hand if you've ever told a lie. If you don't have your hand up, you're a liar. <laughs> okay, now, so just wanted to cover that. Now, how many of you have ever stolen something, taken something from work, even a paper clip? It's not yours. How many of you have ever done that? You've done that? Okay, okay. Well, you're all a bunch of thieves, too. <laughs> and how many of you, when you slam a, you know, a, a hammer on your thumb or something, go, oh, Jesus! Have you ever done that? Okay, that's called blasphemy. That's called speaking the name... The Lord's name in vain. That's on the 10. By the way, I've only covered three, and you are all a bunch of liars and thieves and blasphemers. <laughs> Shall I get into adultery <laughs> or covetousness? No, you're guilty, and so am I. <laughs> Welcome to our world. We're a mess, for all have sinned, and all have fallen short of the glory of God. And it should make you uncomfortable. It should. And if it doesn't, then I didn't preach it right. Because it should make you uncomfortable. It should make you the most uncomfortable person in this room. But there's another scripture you need to know. It says this. It says, yeah, the wages of sin. What you have admitted to right now, you just admitted to being liars and thieves and blasphemers. Right now, you just did. 
You owned up to it. That's sin. And the wages of that sin is death. And the word death here is, he's not talking just about physical death, although that's a part of it. He's talking about decay in your relationships. If you look around you and you go, why are my relationships falling apart? It's because of sin in your life. In decay, he's looking at, I, I have no fulfillment in my life. I have an emptiness in my soul that no amount of drink and no amount of partying can seem to fill. That's a decay. That's death. And that's because of the sin that's in your life. But here's the good part. I love the second half of this verse. But it says the gift of God. What is he talking about gift? We're talking about Jesus being born. He's the ultimate gift from God to you. We give gifts because he is the ultimate gift. That's why we're going to get up tomorrow and give gifts. It's not because we love our family. It's because God loved us. And he gave his only son to give us eternal life because the wages of this sin is death. It's all around us. It de the decay in our relationships, our divorce rate, the, dis the fights that we keep getting in and they won't seem to stop, the problems that you have, the addictions, the, the destruction, the war, the hate in this world, it all comes because of the wages of sin. And all of you are guilty. And me too. I could point to a lot of things. But you know, when you break the law, listen to me, when you break God's law, God can't just let you off. It doesn't work that way. Because some people say, well, God is loving and God understands that, that nobody's perfect, so he'll just let me off because I'm good. In fact, if I do more good things, I will convince him to let me off. Most people believe that. They believe, well, I've done more good than bad, and so I'm gonna, I, you know, God's going to let me off. Well, wait a minute. Let's think about a judge for a second. A judge on the bench doesn't let people off from a bribe. You don't bribe the judge. Not a good judge. You see, a good judge is going to, he's never going to let a guilty person off. Are you kidding? Only a corrupt judge can be bought off. So if you try to buy off God with a bunch of good deeds, it's like trying to bribe a judge. It doesn't work. It does not work. Because God is a good judge. He's not going to let you off. In fact, if there is a, if there is a crime committed, it creates a debt. It's not just, I did something wrong. No, you, you, you have created a debt with the law. There's a fine for this. How many of you know that if you get caught speeding, you get a fine? How many of you don't like that? I don't like that. If you don't have your hand up, you haven't been pulled over lately. Okay? So there's a debt. And what, what God is saying, what Jesus was saying is he's saying, look, if you don't put your trust in me to pay off that debt, you're condemned already. You're already done. The law proves it. The law shows that you have been condemned. The reason Jesus came was to pay a debt, your debt, a debt you cannot pay. So how do you accept his payment? That's the key. That's what he's saying in John chapter 3. You've got to believe in me is what he says. Now, the word believe there in Greek is pistis, and it's a very deep word. It doesn't mean believe like I believe I'm going to have another Dr. Pepper. Or I believe that Donald Trump is currently the president of the United States. That happens to be a fact. Because I could say, I believe that Barack Obama is still president. That is contrary to fact. Okay? So you can believe things that are contrary to fact. That's not the kind of belief he's talking about. That's not what pistis means. Pistis does not mean uh, an intellectual understanding of things. No, 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 no. He's talking about a heart change. He's talking about something completely different, something very much deeper than just an intellectual thing. He's talking about repentance. And I want to explain what that word means. See, the only way you can be saved from the debt that you have laid out is by repenting. Now, some of you are listening to me, and you're thinking to yourself, I've heard this message before. I've accepted this message before, and the pastor is currently preaching to the choir. What a waste of time. Is it lunchtime yet? Hold your horses. 
Because I had to pray a long time about what this sermon was going to be because it wasn't supposed to be about this message. When I, when I started praying about it and I started sitting down, I was going to do a completely different thing. I had John chapter 14 in mind and I had something else completely done. I even advertised it that way. And the Holy Spirit said, are you working for me or the ad agency that you just put out? I said, well, boss, I'm working for you. And he said, then you're not going to preach about John 14. You're going to preach about John 3. And I said, but Lord, I've preached that before. These people have heard that. And he said, take them deeper. All of them. Because there are plenty of you that are Christians, and you understand about where I'm going to go when I talk about repentance. But you still, listen to me, you still live with a chain wrapped around your neck called guilt. And you may understand that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. You may even believe it. But there's a difference between believing that something is true and believing in it. Big difference. And we're about to go there. Repent. What does it mean to repent? He's talking about turning from a rule of self. You've been ruled by self. You see, many people, this is the problem, many people think that being religious, going to church, reading the Bible, better yet, trying to be good, you know, I don't do those things anymore, and I don't hang around with people that do those things except every once in a while. Okay, you know, and, you know, I got all kinds of justifications for stuff, but you're trying to be good because that's what you're trying to do to either impress God or, quote, unquote, be a Christian, and you do not understand. That's not what being a Christian is at all. It's, it's not even close. Repenting means, you see, the problem with that thinking, listen to that thinking for a second. It's still about yourself, isn't it? I'm still trying to solve a personal problem. I want to feel better about myself, so I'm going to live good. So who's running things? Yourself. I'm trying to solve a problem by going to church or believing in Jesus and, and praying. You're still all about your problem. It's still all about you. It's still preferring self over God's rule. That's a completely different thing. To repent is a complete change of thinking. Listen to me. When we talk about a heart change, we're talking about a thinking change. We're talking about setting your thinking, setting your heart, setting your mind on a completely different way. You were this way where it's all about me. I'm a Christian so long as it affects me, so long as it helps me in my recovery, so long as it helps me, I'm good. But as soon as it doesn't, I have all kinds of excuses for going and dabbling over here and I sit on the fence. No, to repent is where you are sold out. You are totally given over to a new way of thinking. Now, you've been willing, listen, you've been willing in your life to accept help. Somebody will give you a handout and you'll say thank you. Somebody will give you advice and you may or may not follow it, but you're grateful. But you see, you're still committed, listen, to your own understanding about how to operate your life. I'll take that advice, but not this advice. Who's running things? You are. I'll take that scripture, but not this one. Who's running things? You are. You're still pref preferring self over God. God is still an addition in your mind, whether you know it or not. You got to look deep. God is medicine to your problem. Medicine. How many of you know there's nothing wrong with medicine? but that's not why Jesus came. Jesus wants a total change of heart where you set your mind, you set your thinking, you set your heart on the absolute rule of Jesus Christ over every single thing you do, say, or think. Everything. You are committed to that. You've put your total trust in Jesus to pay your total debt, all of it. Past, present, and future. All of it. You've put your trust in him to guide you about how you should operate in your life. You are preferring Jesus' leadership to your own self-understanding. So let's think about the difference. If Jesus is just an addition to you, he's just medicine to a wound, 
or is he the air that you breathe? Do you see the difference? Let me say it again. If Jesus, in your mind, is just an addition to your life, he's just medication, then you're not getting what the word pistis means. No, he needs to be the air that you breathe. You cannot live otherwise. That's the type of heart change that we're talking about. That's what the word pistis means. Now, if you make this heart decision, you may not understand all the ins and outs, all the doctrines. You may not get it. And some of you are looking at me going, well, I really do believe in Jesus, and I, I really did ask him to forgive my sins, and, and I'm really sincere, and I think you are, and I think you're genuinely saved, and I think you're genuinely going to heaven. But God wants to take you a whole lot deeper than that. He wants every part of you. Now, here's the kicker. You see, if you change your heart around like that, where you've made him the absolute Lord and King, it's all him, it's all about him, then God will apply, listen to me, God will apply what Jesus did, his birth, his death, his resurrection, he will apply it to your debt. And how many of you know it's going to pay it all off? All of it. It pays it all. It pays it all off because your situation is absolutely hopeless without your ticket being paid, but only God can pay it. And so he did. That's why Jesus came, and that's the depth of it. Now, let's take a look at that a little deeper, and then we'll close. Romans 10, 8. This is going to help you understand it. And I'm reading this in the New Living Translation, so you can really get a, kind of a sense of it. Salvation. That means being put right with God. That's what it means to be a Christian. Well, that comes from trusting Jesus. We just talked about that. That's the message that I'm preaching, that we preach, that Paul preached, that the disciples preached, that Jesus preached. It's what we're all about here. And it's already within easy reach. Now, some of you look at that and go, easy? How is it easy to live this Christian life? Then you missed something. You see, it's all about trusting him, not your works. You can't buy off the judge. Your good works don't do it. It's all about your faith, your choice of the heart to make Jesus the absolute Lord of your life. So it's an easy reach. In fact, the scriptures say this, the message is close at hand. It's, it's on your lips. It's in your heart. It's right there. For if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Now, that's not just saying words. It's not magic words. When you confess with your mouth, you got to understand the context of this. We're talking about the Roman Empire. To confess out loud with your mouth that Jesus is Lord is to say that Caesar is not. And you just put your life on the line. That's what he's saying. You put your life on the line. He is now the air that I breathe. He is my king. How he says to be married, that's how I'm going to be married. How he says to live, that's how I live. What he says to do with my life and his spirit speaks to me, that's what I do. That's Jesus is Lord. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You put your trust that his sacrifice on that cross pays for your sins, then you will be saved. So what does this mean? It means that you are saved by, listen, your faith alone in Christ alone. It's not about good works. You see, the legalistic people, you know, they say, well, you got to wear the right tie. I hate ties. And you got to wear, you know, the right threads. Honestly, you got to come to church four times a week. You got to read this. You got to, 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 got to. And then you're a good Christian. I was, I ran into a person just a week ago. It was saying, I really struggle with trying to be a good Christian. I'm going, why? You're not. <laughs> what do you mean? Listen, and this is the thing I really want you to grab. Listen to what he says there. You will be saved for it is by believing, not good works. It's by believing in your heart that you're made right with God. That's the key. And it is by confessing with your mouth that you're a slave. Because what comes out of the mouth, the Bible says that from out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And what he's saying is, is as the scripture tells you, anyone who believes in him, they'll not be disappointed. Listen, many people live with constant guilt. They supposedly became Christians, but they can't live up to it. 
There's this great big list, and, and, and he's got a different list for me than, than he does. And, and she keeps telling me, I'm not living, and you're, you know, you're doing this, you're that. Everybody seems to have a different list. And you live with constant guilt because you can't live up to the list. And many people are burdened by that. They can't be good enough Christians. Now, let me explain something to you. And this goes to every person. Listen. They're, like I said, nominal Christians. These are people, they're lukewarm. They, 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 they're here maybe because they're trying to get things better in their life. There's nothing wrong with that motivation, by the way. You just got to go deeper. Maybe you came here because you're looking for answers to life's deepest questions. That's okay. We'll give you some answers. But you got to go deeper than that. Maybe you're here because there's pain in your life and you've got an addiction you need to break. That's okay. That's good. We'll help you with that. But you got to go deeper than that. And where you got to go is you got to, listen to me, you got to understand that God does not love you because you are a good person. He does not love you because you are a good person. He's not going to love you more because you're more gooder. And the more good you can do, he's going to love you more. doesn't work that way. God loves you because God is love. And he is willing, listen, he is willing to make you into a good person because he loves you. That's the difference. Now let me say it again. Because it's profound and it should grab you. God doesn't love you because you're a good person. God is willing to make you into a good person because he loves you. If you, by your free will, are willing to turn and say, I will make Jesus the utter, absolute, and total Lord of my life, then he will begin the process of making you into a good person. See, too many people have, have it backwards. I got to try to be good in order to get God to like me. Look, God likes you already. And you look at yourself in the mirror and you go, I've had so many people say, I got to clean myself up before I can go to church. Are you kidding? This is the shower. <laughs> this is the shower. No, 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 no. God loves you. You're a mess. He loves you. He loves you because he loves you. I have five children. I love them all. And some of them are a mess. Some of them make a really big mess. And I got to clean it. And when they were this big, it was a really big mess. And I still loved them. I didn't love them because they were good. I loved them because I loved them and they were my kids. And I worked hard as a parent to make them into good kids, didn't I? If you ask them, they'll say, I worked too hard at it. Okay, but you know what? That's who your father in heaven is. He loves you despite the fact you have broken his law. He loves you despite the fact that you have offended him. He loves you despite the fact that no matter how hard you try, you can't even live up to your own standard, much less his. He loves you anyway. And he is willing to make you into a good person if you will receive that love. Now look, if you refuse to receive that love, that means you love darkness more than you love light and you are condemned already and you will be separated from him forever. But you don't have to be because God loves you and is willing to give his only son as the ultimate gift to pay your debt. Now, as a Christian, if you, you know all that stuff, you, can, you could recite that doctrine back to me. But how many of you as Christians have lived with this burden of not being a good enough Christian, because I have, until I realized, I read those words, it, it brought me to tears, because I was so messed up. I was going, here I am, I'm a Christian. I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor of a church. I have a master's degree in theology. And I still keep doing things that are just monumentally stupid all the time. I still lose my temper and something will come out of me that will remind me of my Canadian lager days. Okay? I, you know, and I go, that's not a good Christian thing to do and I feel guilt. And my master finally said to me in my prayer time, because I was so burdened by this. I was sitting on a log, because that's what loggers do, and I was praying and I said, God, can you forgive a man 
for his entire life. I keep messing up. I keep trying to be a Christian. And I got, I swear, only twice in my life have I heard a voice that I, I believe was God, the voice of God. And he spoke to me. And he said, you belong to me. I belong to him. He's making me into a good person. I don't have to be a good person to earn his love. He loves me. And he's making me into a good person. And every time I mess up, it's not about guilt anymore. It's about falling on my face and saying, oh God, it's so good that you still love me. And because you love me, I want to do better. Not because I'm earning it, because I already got everything I need from you. You see, this morning, Christian, he wants to take the burden and the chain that you've wrapped around your neck of trying to live up to a list. It's not giving you an excuse to go off and do whatever you want to do and, and not care anymore about how you live. I'm not giving you that permission, no way. And neither is God. It's different. So let's pray about this.